This podcast is supported by Area 9 Lyceum. Cut training time in half, create higher proficiency, leave no learner behind and improve business outcomes with Area 9's AI-driven adaptive learning technology. The platform Area 9 Rapsode is grounded in scientific research, serving more than 30 million learners across hundreds of subject areas, gathering billions of data points. Whether your focus is K-12, post-secondary, vocational training, graduate school professional development or lifelong learning, experience adaptive learning for yourself at area9lyceum.com slash learning hack. That's area9lyceum.com slash learning hack. Welcome to Hacking Ukraine, a learning hack special. Over three episodes, we tell the story of what happened when John Helmer hitched a ride with Andy Wooler, chair of Ukraine Fundraiser 2022, to help deliver humanitarian aid to recently bombed Lviv. In this two and a half thousand mile non-stop journey, they cross seven countries, chat about the conflict, about learning, learning, and about anything else that floats into their poor sleep deprived noggins. Episode 1. Getting There. Hi, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, On the 1st of August, uh, I'm in Brighton in my, what feels at the moment, very comfortable um, learning hat shack, where I record the podcasts, uh, contemplating a week, which is going to be a bit less comfortable. I think, although it's kind of largely unknown. We'll be leaving later today, uh, later this evening, um, travelling overnight uh, on a ferry to the continent, um, going at that hour deliberately to kind of uh, avoid rushes at any of the ports or the uh, customs that that we have to go through as we cross borders uh, in Northern Europe. and eventually get into Ukraine. The truck has already been packed. It's filled with electric wheelchairs, mobility scooters, walking aids, or zimmer frames, as they used to be called, I suppose, medical supplies and PPE. And we're going to a hospital in Lviv where all this stuff is very much needed, as you can imagine. A bit of good news, we are below the weight limit and my lack of weight has helped that so I feel like I've done something useful so far uh, with, 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 which is kind of one of my worries uh, about the trip that I'll, I'll just kind of get in the way and be a nuisance what other anxieties do I have about it? well, I'm nervous, obviously we're going to a war zone uh, but less frightened than perhaps I ought to be partly because it, it's pretty unknown I, I don't know what it's going to be like nothing in my experience to compare it to except perhaps getting in a transit van in the um, late 70s um, and travelling to places like Glasgow where they threw bottles at you on the stage and, of course, it being punk rock days, gobbed at you. But, of course, it's nothing like that. I mean, it's not a jaunt. This is really quite serious stuff. So I've had a fairly frivolous life, I suppose. don't have that much to compare it to. But at least I know that it's in a good cause. Uh, of course, I'll be very sad to say goodbye to my loved ones, children, grandchild and the dogs. Um, and I know that they'll be worried. So that kind of is, is uh, a bit unpleasant. So I'll have to keep in touch with them to make sure that I'm all right and reassure them that I'm going to come back safe and sound. So I also plan to do the podcast on the way there. This will cover not only uh, learning-focused stuff, like obviously Andy is a a formidable figure in learning technologies, particularly in AI, so there's a lot to talk about with generative AI and so on, how that's affecting L&D. In a wider lens, as we go through Northern Europe, I I want to be recalling the uh, biographies and work of some of the theorists we've covered on Great Minds on Learning, as we go through their birthplaces or, you know, places where they went to university. And I think there's a big story there to be told about the um, uh, European history of the 20th century and the diaspora that that was caused by the the horrors of the Second World War. So that's the plan, anyway. There may be trouble ahead 
But while there's moonlight and music and love and romance. Before we leave, Andy has a commitment to fulfil, a rehearsal with the Uckfield Concert Brass, a band he plays in and sometimes conducts. Like me, Andy has musical roots, as well as being a senior vice president of adaptive learning company Area 9 Lyceum, he is also trustee and until recently chair of the Sussex Symphony Orchestra. But pretty soon we're on the road. As we thunder down the country lanes of Sussex and Kent, Andy reflects on the importance of rehearsals. They're a very vital part of uh, making music and um, you know, as you saw with our guest conductor tonight, the stopping and going over something again, you know, the repeated practicing of something to get it right. Um, and then you hope that each week as you do this, and where similar sort of challenges in different works, but they have the same underlying challenge, they, they become part of your toolkit as a player and you start moving from practicing to get it right to practicing it so you can't get it wrong, which of course is the ultimate aim, isn't it? Yeah. Um, sort of relates directly back to that whole concept of automaticity, you know, that you actually do things without thinking. As I'm doing now driving, I'm not thinking about when I'm going to press the, uh, the clutch and change gear and what gear I'm going to go into. It will happen naturally <clears throat> without thinking and that's... Um, that's, that, that's the benefit of the rehearsals, is getting you to that stage, I think. And very often you'll be, if you're doing a concert, you'll be rehearsing the same pieces for a number of weeks. Um, and in an amateur band, of course, that very invariably be once a week. In some bands, twice. But So you're getting spaced repetition. Yeah. Which, of course, we know is a very good thing that helps to reinforce the, the things you've learned along the way. Yeah, so hold that thought. Pack facts. As Andy and John make their way through Northern Europe, passing birthplaces and significant locations associated with theorists from our Great Minds on Learning podcast, we'll feature their lives and work. Listen out for Theorists' Corner. Right, fabulous. We're, we've arrived in Dover, sailed straight into the port. Absolutely no problems whatsoever. Very quick, very easy. Um, and so we're here in the queue for the 2 a.m. ferry out to Dunkirk. Um, what do you think of the show so far, John? Rubbish. <laughs> well, I hope you don't think it's rubbish, listeners. Once on the ferry, we snatched a couple of hours sleep. Me on a bonquette, Andy on the floor, then arrived in Dunkirk, ready to hit our thousand mile journey to the Polish border with Ukraine. Good morning. We're in Bruges, 88 miles to Brussels. We're in France for about 15, 25 minutes, 20 minutes and then passed into Belgium and um, now heading for the border into Holland. Uh, the rain is absolutely tipping down. It's uh, disgusting weather, um, stability quite low. And uh, Andy tells me that uh, Belgium has some of the worst drivers in the world. So this is what used to be the border. Right. Oh, yeah. This is where all the customs stuff was on each side. The border officers, ships were halfway across here, so the huts have gone and everything. Yeah, the Belgian Dutch border. Yeah. At Dover, we had border checks. At the Ukraine border, we can expect a pretty thorough going over, but crossing the frontiers in between those two borders, there will be no such friction. On account of this thing they have in the EU called free movement. The one-time Greek finance minister Yanis Varoufakis thought that the only way to understand the EU was through game theory. And as we enter the Netherlands, we
we recall an important Dutch learning theorist who was the first to bring to our attention the importance of games in learning and in culture generally. Yes, folks, it's time for Theorist's Corner. Johan Huizinger, 1872-1945, was a Dutch historian born in Groningen. He was Professor of General and Dutch History at Groningen University before moving to a post at Leiden University in 1905. He's best known for his work on games. His doctoral thesis was on the role of the jester in Indian drama, and in 1938 he published his groundbreaking work Homo Ludens, which discusses the importance of the play element of culture and society. This is a brilliant book. This book was to prove hugely influential when, with the rise of computer games and the spread of e-learning in the early years of the 20th century, later theorists like G and Prensky began to explore the power of games and gamification for learning. Homo Ludens had a much wider focus, however. Huisinger even applied his theory of play to war. And it was indeed the Second World War that put an end to his ability to teach. Alarmed by the rise of National Socialism in Germany, Husinger wrote works of cultural criticism, and it was criticism of his country's German occupiers in 1942 that led to his being detained by the Nazis and banned from Leiden. Sadly, he never lived to see the end of Nazi rule. Much earlier in his career, in 1924, Huisinger wrote a book about Erasmus, another Dutch learning theorist we covered in Great Minds on Learning, in our episode on religious educators. Desiderius Erasmus, 1466 to 1536, was a priest born out of wedlock, quite possibly gay, and a reformer who nevertheless stayed within the Catholic Church all his life. Born in Rotterdam, probably, and ordained in holy orders, he turned down professorship at Cambridge to teach at Oxford, and also worked in Belgium, Germany, Italy, Switzerland and France. He was incredibly famous in his own time. By the 1530s, his writings accounted for 10-20% to of all book sales in Europe, and they included several important works on learning. Erasmus laid the egg, it was said. Luther hatched it. He is considered one of the greatest scholars of the Northern Renaissance, and his work brought about a complete change in the attitude towards learning. His book Copia, Foundations of the Abundant Style, was a deep dive into learning theory. It sort of talks a lot about pedagogy and style. You know, in other words, this is all about teaching and good teaching techniques. And this goes back to some of the figures we've already mentioned, the revelation that teachers should not be beating people into submission. Mm. And then with the you know, he has several other brilliant texts here, you know, the right, uh, right Method of Instruction, and another really good one on the education for children, which is, you know, drawing out, as it's an educare, uh, you know, a drawing out of knowledge, not uh, a beating knowledge into people. And very practical stuff, you know, like take notes. <laughs> and note-taking in your own words, always have a notebook on hand was, you know, th this is the sort of stuff he's coming to a real detailed understanding of both teaching and learning. He's also very good at retrieval practice, curiously, and repetition. I mean, this is, you know, hundreds of years before Ebbinghaus and modern theory on this. But he really does understand the nature of memory and describes describes memory, actually, you know, uh, and the, the retrieval practice and the importance of internal rehearsal, recalling things and repeating them and repeating them with understanding and using techniques like, Images, charts, and tables to understand knowledge, making it visual as well. Uh, teaching yourself what you think you know in order to reinforce the learning and put it into long-term memory. He really understood the mechanisms of memory, which is interesting. In the Netherlands, we grab our first coffee break since Dunkirk, and I take the opportunity to ask Andy about his work on adaptive learning. We last spoke on the podcast almost exactly a year ago, and since then there has been a huge explosion of interest in AI, due largely to ChatGPT. Has all that changed anything for adaptive learning companies like Area 9 Lyceum? It's a good question, John, actually, because the, um, the foundations of, of uh, our adaptive tool are 20 odd years um, ago, um, and AI has been in the tool ever since then. So. GPT, as opposed to ChatGPT, is just another tool that we have uh, used within the platform for uh, the appropriate use. 
where I think I'm seeing stuff on uh, LinkedIn in particular is where people are talking about chat GPT as if it's the learner who's going to be using it. And that's not, that's not where we are with it. Where we're using it is, is the, um, the power of GPT-4 to enable quicker, very rapid content curation. Okay, so it's in the actual preparation Absolutely, like, of the yeah. content, in the, the creation and generation of the content from a field of knowledge. And... Yeah, so I mean, if, if a customer gives us um, an, some existing content, yeah. um, and I don't know whether we've done it with this, but it's uh, going back to my Hitachi days, if you took a technical manual for a, for a, uh, a data center server, you've got hundreds of pages of stuff yeah. that something like GPT-4 would be very good at being able to analyze that and um, work out what the learning objectives are. In a similar way to, to, to uh, you know, Donald Clark's wildfire tool, where he's done exactly that um, in a slightly different way because he uses Wikipedia as part of the, um, obviously, the data set for what comes out. But, yeah. Um, and that's a very different scenario to allowing the end users anywhere near it, because, you know, unless they can actually start to write um, the um, probing questions, as we would call them. The prompts. The prompts, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, in the right way to ensure that you don't get hallucination and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't think people are there yet. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of, as you say, there's a huge amount of hype about everybody's talking about chat GPT. Um, and we're not. Um, that I've spoken about GPT-4, yeah. the, the, you know, the native tool, not the, the chat front end. To it. Yeah. So um, aside from the functionality, what has the kind of hype around AI now? Because it, it you know, this, this thing about chat GPT has just heightened the whole thing about AI, completely brought it into the visibility of not only the public, but government. It's no longer a mathsy thing. It's something that people feel they can get their own hands on and sort of talk to with natural language and so on. Is that kind of change in the temperature of the debate good or bad for adaptive learning, do you think? Do you think adaptive learning maybe kind of disappears a bit underneath all that <laughs> hype, or does it actually help people to understand it more? Uh, do you know, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. I, I, I'm not sure of the answer to that because ultimately not everybody understands adaptive learning anyway. Um, I think as we discussed last time, there are different versions of adaptive, which yeah. if, when you look at some of them, they are, they are no more than, you know, role-based curriculum decisions that say, because you have this job, then you're going to follow this path. Uh, they're not truly adaptive in, in, in the way that our tool um, and some of the others are. Um, so, you know, it's... Um, we, we haven't been hyping this up. You won't have seen anything from us, particularly apart from some thought leadership articles from our CEO, Rick Gil Christensen, who uh, you know, has got the brain the size of a planet um, and really understands this stuff. So we haven't been out there hyping it up like some other vendors may well have done and commentators and, as you say, every man and his dog on LinkedIn yeah. now is a GPT-4 expert. Really? Yeah. This excuse my sarcasm there, but uh, well, yeah, I've, we've seen this all before, haven't we? I saw this with the, the emergence of um, rapid content development tools, where uh, yeah. suddenly everybody who could create a PowerPoint was given articulate uh, or storyline or, or um, lector, yeah, and suddenly they're all instructional designers. Once again, really? Yeah. They're not. Um, in the same way that I think a lot of the a lot of people who talk about chat GPT um, from a learning perspective uh, are thinking about it in a very different way to the way you would think about it as a I've, I'm developing a platform. What is the best use of generative uh, um, AI in this platform? What's the, going to be the best results for the customer and for us? And I think in our yeah. case, the, the very clear winner right now. That's not to say it'll only be the only thing we use it for, but right now it is the speed in which content can be created. Yeah. Um, 
And it's not just the AI. The AI is part of the tool set. Um, ultimately, the, what we call a learning engineer is going to be the arbiter of whether that content remains as GPT presents it or whether it needs further modification. Um, you, can't, you don't take the human out of the equation. I think that's a big mistake if you do. Time to get back on the road. But before we do, let's remind ourselves what this is all about. The point of the trip is getting humanitarian aid to Ukraine fast. Since Ukraine Fundraiser 2022 formed at the start of the Russian invasion, the organisation has made more than 18 runs to Kyiv, the Donetsk region, Zaporizhia, Lviv, Dnipro and other destinations, targeting aid to those who need it most. Times may be difficult at home, but in Ukraine there are people whose lives have been totally destroyed. This effort relies on your donations, so please give what you can, no matter how small, on the Just Giving page at this link. Every penny you give will go to helping sufferers from this cruel conflict rebuild their lives. The link for your donations is justgiving.com slash crowdfunding slash Ukraine Fundraiser 2022. That's justgiving.com slash crowdfunding slash Ukraine Fundraiser 2022. Uh, we are a totally voluntary organisation. Nobody's paid for anything. And um, we have two vans. To, to bring two vans out to Kiev, but you're talking, you know, between 1,000 and 1,500 per van to get to Kiev. And if we do that every month, that's trying to raise £3,000 every month. But, you know, if we had 2,500 people listening to your podcast and each one of them just put the price of a cup of coffee, that would furnish both of our vans on a ship. The biggest challenge for us as an organisation is raising that money. We do it in various ways. But uh, so I don't want to go full Bob Geldof on everybody. Give us the money. There are people dying now. Without the money, we can't come out of it. At the other end of this whole... Um, ecosystem are the charities or the end recipients in in Ukraine. So we work very often with a, char a Kiev-based charity called Future of the Children of Ukraine. Uh, the stuff we take to them, some is distributed in the Kiev area to displace families with children. Other stuff gets taken down to places like Donetsk, Bakhmut and uh, Zaporizhia. Uh, they have to get it there. They have to have vans. They have to have diesel. Lot. Um, we're making just ridiculous time since we uh, set off this morning from Dunkirk. Uh, we're now in Germany. Um, so we've been traveling through the Ruhr and the, the, the Rhine and um, areas that you have uh, a lot of history with. Um, first off, with your military background. So, could you tell us a little bit about that, about the associations this part of Germany? Sure, yeah. I mean, I was a musician in one of the parachute regiment bands. I enlisted in 1974, um, did the first nine weeks of the standard Paris basic training, lost two stone, <laughs> um, declined their, their kind offer to, to jump out of aeroplanes and then went straight to my band and uh, had a six-year career there, including a year at the Royal Military School of Music at Nella Hall. Yeah. Um, two and a half years of that uh, time, I was posted out here as part of the British Army of the Rhine um, with a secondary um, role as a uh, sort of level three medic. Uh, so it's not quite stretcher bearing, it's a little bit above that. So we learned basic stuff around how to deal with stoned in chests and suturing people and that kind of stuff. So yeah. you're safe on this trip if any of that happens, John, but don't trust me with a heart attack. Okay. <laughs> so what was the style of your military training? It was very typical of uh, how you would train a 17 and a half year old to um, <laughs> adjust to service life. You know, at 17 and a half, you have no idea, you have no clue. Um, and a lot of what you do is is about getting your basic fitness up. It's about instilling that sense of discipline and the ability to 
to respond to a command without having to think about it. And so you get to do some very, what seemed to you at the time, very stupid and strange things. Um, but later on, you realize why it was done in that way. Yeah. Uh, things like the, the infamous bed block, which some people listening will have seen on Bad Lads Army, where you have to present your bedding every morning in a particular way, fold it up and everything in the right place in your locker. Yeah. Um, and in those days, National Service days, if it wasn't up to scratch, it very likely went out the window. The corporal would have just thrown it out the window and said, right, you know, show parade tonight, do it again. Mm. <laughs> and that seems pointless when you're doing it, but when you look back on it, uh, the ability in a, in a conflict to just respond to an order that you've been given, yeah. um, you know, can be the difference between life and death. So it's not until later in life you get to understand that, I think. Yeah, and probably later in life, how do you reflect on the, the start of that training as a learning professional who has spent a lifetime involved in the creation, design, delivery of uh, mostly organisational learning. I, I think the, the fact that the British Army is a professional army and it's viewed as one of the most professional in the world is a testament to the training that, that is given to them. And, you know, you, cut, you don't come out of basic training with finished article. It's a constant, ongoing lifelong pro learning process when you're in. Um, you know, you go on manoeuvres to practice stuff. Um, and there's a lot of spaced repetition going on in, in here. And, and certainly from my perspective, having left the army in 1979, um, our friend Ebbinghouse is very much at the front of my mind. Yeah. When, when you, I was talking about being trained as a medic, I wouldn't trust me as a medic right now. Yeah. Because it's all been forgotten, because I haven't had the opportunity to put it into practice since I left. Yeah. Um, it's but, great that you bring up Ebbinghouse. It's like you've been reading my notes. Because <laughs> we passed by very close to his birthplace, Bogotá. Um, and there is a lot to say about it. Of course, the Ebbinghouse curve being the big one. How useful have you found his style? It's actually one of the, of course, sort of. Um, learning sciences that sits behind what we do with adaptive learning because it's not just about getting people to competence it's how do you keep them there to help deal with that that's the problems that Ebbinghouse has um, identified um, so certainly our product at Area 9 has a lot of um, refresh of areas where from the analytics we have, the things you weren't sure of, you may have got them right, but you weren't sure, so that will be represented to you as an individual learning um, objective item until such time as you reach that state of automaticity. It's a very important part of the, the, the sciences behind adaptive learning is, is how, do you, how do you deal with the forgetting curve and keeping people not, not only getting them to full competence, but keeping them there until that automaticity is in place that they do it without thinking. Hermann Ebbinghaus, 1850 to 1909, was a German psychologist who pioneered the experimental study of memory and is known for his discovery of the forgetting curve and the spacing effect. He was also the first person to describe the learning curve. Born in Barmen, now part of Wuppertal, in the then Kingdom of Prussia, he founded the third psychological testing lab in Germany, Wilhelm Wundt having set up the first in Leipzig, and was one of the founding fathers of experimental psychology. I bang on far too much about Ebbinghaus, but his forgetting curve really is fundamental to understanding the mechanics of learning. Erasmus was there first, and again and again we see this important insight being rediscovered throughout history memory and its failings are at the core of how we learn or fail to learn. As we travel from the west of Germany into what was the east, crossing the old Iron Curtain, we're heading deep into Luther country. Luther was born in Eisleben, which we pass pretty close by on the way. Martin Luther, 1483 to 1546, was a German priest, theologian, author, hymn writer, professor and Augustinian friar. He was the seminal figure of the Protestant Reformation and his theological beliefs formed the basis of Lutheranism. Suddenly Christianity embraced the idea that learning and schooling was a good 
thing, knowing about earth, the earthly world, as it were, as opposed to the heavenly realm only, was a very positive thing. Mm. So Luther is unique because he actually writes, he writes books, two big books on education. And they've got really weird titles. It doesn't sound as though they're, they're a very educational book. The first one was addressing the mayor, the mayors and aldermen of the cities of Germany. It's actually called that on behalf of Christian schools. It's got schools in the title. He's recommending that they introduce universal schooling. And then a second book, The Duty of Sending Children to School. The duty of sending children to school means that it's a religious imperative that we put scripture and Christian belief in the hands of the people and that they must understand and read scripture directly in their own language. I feel like we're traveling through cultural history. We pass Leipzig, where Wagen was born, where Bach was director of church music for 27 years. The city also of Schumann, Mendelssohn, Mahler, not to mention Goethe, Nietzsche, Leibniz, Heisenberg, and Angela Merkel went to university there. But a darker side of history appears on the road signs too recalling World War II. Colditz, Dresden, firebombed by the Allies, so it goes. And then, of course, the camps. We're diverted through the town of Nordhausen, where a museum commemorates one of the lesser-known Nazi concentration camps, a sub-camp of Buchenwald. We tend to remember the names of just a few of the camps, Auschwitz, Belsen, Treblinka, and so on, but there were more than a thousand. Buchenwald alone had 136 subcamps. Things turn darker as we enter Poland. Literally, it's night again, but you begin to see tanks and heavy vehicles on the motorway headed towards Ukraine. We're getting seriously tired now, Andy and I. Meanwhile, our thoughts turn to what we will find on the other side of the border. You want to say something? Yeah, I'll give you a Spanish one. Juan two. Juan, Juan two. two. Yes. yes. <laughs> Lovely. Well, just the two Polish time. We're in Poland. Uh, we are what halfway through Poland? How far from the border? Into we are now two hundred and eighty-six miles away from the border, okay. which sounds a lot better than the one thousand and forty-five where we started at Dunkirk. Yes. Seems like this morning, but it probably yesterday. Maybe a couple of days ago. <laughs> As we get closer to that border, um, shit gets real, doesn't it? I mean, things feel a bit more serious. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about some of the dangers that you face doing these runs, you and your team? Um, uh, the, well, there are many. Um, um, not so much from the, the rocket attacks, and there have been a lot, obviously. Um, the Ukrainian defence, air defence, are extremely good at shooting the bulk of them down. But, of course, if you shoot a rocket down, there is debris which falls, and that has been causing a lot of damage in itself. And if you happen to be unfortunate enough to be underneath it, then um, that's a problem. That hasn't happened to us yet. Um, I have experienced a, the whoosh of a rocket going over the van three or four trips ago, which was uh, what the heck was that moment. <laughs> um, and of course, the, um, the unstable political situation out there now, well, the military situation as regards the, the Wagner Group and uh, Belarus, what's going on up there, because the, of course we are travelling in the north of Ukraine, which is at, at its narrowest point, 150 miles or something like that, from the Belarus border at both ends, at the uh, Polish end and at the Kyiv end. Um, so we, we do monitor constantly the um, the awesome apps that the Ukrainian government have put into place for monitoring um, air raid warnings. So my, my sat nav, you might have spotted, it pops up every so often with with the uh, preset locations I've got as to when the air raid sirens are on or off. Uh, the trip before last was the first time I we actually went to a bomb shelter, uh, which was a uh, an interesting experience because we hadn't had to do that before and the, the family we stay with are the, the, the resilience like the rest of the Ukrainian people to a, a level that is just unbelievable um, and when they say we're going to the shelter you know it's uh, it's something you have to do <clears throat> that was a, one of the nights when there was a relentless rocket attack on Kiev uh, city and the place we stay Brovery is about 20 kilometers out from the city center so mm. Um, 
when the um, I haven't uh, been further than Kiev since my very first trip when we went to Zaporizhia. Mike, the uh, founder of the organisation, has done two trips to the Donetsk region, mm. um, and th those are the sort of times when we we do have um, ballistic vests. Um, as you know, there's one sat behind you on your seat there with uh, uh, your blood group on it and uh, a big sign saying volunteer. Yeah. Uh, so Mike has been in situations where he has worn that as a precaution. Um, you know, I have a, a special forces grade helmet as well, should we need it. So we're, we're very well prepared um, and touch wood at this point in time, haven't personally experienced it, either of us being uh, shot at or bombed or uh, but the, the charity we work with the young lady who runs that has yeah. um, and one of the things they do in addition to taking aid to families in the, in in those dangerous places is they bring orphans children out and mothers with you know where the father is either fighting or has sadly died bring them out and um, she had two children in the van when a mortar um, attack happened and they they got out of the van uh, and she laid on top of the kids to protect them and she took the force of the uh, shrapnel in her abdomen mm. and landed up in hospital um that wasn't the first time she's had a shrapnel wound as part of her her work down there so it can be dangerous um we haven't as a team uh, been in that situation yet, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. And we are, of course, prepared for that. We have risk assessments in place. Uh, we have exit plans on how to get out of the country should anything happen, um, as you and I know, because we discussed that over coffee We've earlier. Gone through, uh, it, the grisly details in some depth. And it's a sobering conversation, <coughs> I have to say, Andy. Well, it is. Um, you know, and going back to what we were talking about earlier about the funding for all of this, in the event that one of us dies, we don't have the funding to get the body back. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, simple things like that. You have to think, oh, how the hell are we going to deal with that? Um, yeah. You know, if we're both injured, that's relatively simple. Uh, we just get somebody to cart us across the border, put the e-hit card on your body and leave it to the poles to sort it out. Yeah. I love this breezy manner you have when you're talking about these things. So we're, we're going to start to progress towards the, the border. Yep. Um, Travelling across borders has, has been pretty simple um, ever since we left France because they're all in the EU. I'm not going to say anything about that. <laughs> um, the, this will be a different kettle of fish, won't it? The, the Poland it is. Ukraine border. What, what should we expect there and what should we expect on the other side? We, we have a phrase we use quite often when we get there, it's time to hurry up and wait. Uh, the border crossing can take anything between two and seven hours, yeah. depending on the people that are there. So going out, of course, you, you queue to get through the Polish um, authorities who will do a passport stamp and they will um, inspect the vehicle. Um, you then move on to the Ukrainian side, which is uh, a little bit more... Uh, uh, well, I mean, we're lucky because we can get through in those sort of times. You will see when we get there that there are queues of HGV lorries. Some have been there for days waiting to get through. Mm. Um, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons we use the vans is because we can get through quicker and we're much more agile then than the, the guys with the big trucks, although they have the bigger payload. Um, Coming back is a different matter. Uh, because then they're searching for different things. On the way in, humanitarian aid, they're very happy they'll take it. Mm. On the way back, you know, they are, I've had every nook and cranny of this van searched on a couple of occasions, and they're looking for war souvenirs, they're looking for guns, ammunition, and all that kind of stuff, because that, they don't want that leaving the country. Okay. And then the Poles do the same thing 10 yards further on. So once we're on the other, we've, we've done customs mm -hmm. on the other side of the border, we're heading to Lviv, which isn't that far from the border, is it? No, it's, 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 I think it's roughly an hour. Um, so, yes, we head to Lviv. We'll be going straight to the, um, the hospital there where the bulk of what's going is going to be delivered. Um, and from there, we will then go to the internal postal service where I've got lots of boxes that have got to go to other parts of the Ukraine. Some is going down to... Kharkiv, uh, Pearson, places like that, Odessa, some is going to Kiev, 
uh, and some is going to Zaporizhia. So it gives us the opportunity to uh, distribute wider than the place we've actually gone to this time. Right. But yes, it's, this is a, a shorter run into the country and there, therefore it is, it's going to be less problematic. Lviv was struck by a rocket whilst I was there. Well, sorry, the day after I left actually Lviv, the time before last I was out there. So I was there on the one day, the next day there was a rocket attack, something like a quarter of a mile from where I had been uh, during that time. So... There's no danger on this trip, let's be honest, but what you have to do is you have to be prepared. As a team, we are constantly thinking about the safety of our team members and anybody who comes with us. You know, Whilst you've signed a disclaimer, we still feel there's a duty of care um, that we have to be thinking about as well. So, yeah. so next stop, Lviv. You've been listening to Hacking Ukraine, a multi-episode special from The Learning Hack. The series is written and produced by John Helmer with help from me, Kate Fitzgerald. All original music is by John Helmer. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Area 9 Lyceum, Andy Wooler and All at Ukraine Fundraiser 2022, as well as Uckfield Concert Brass. Next time on Hack in Ukraine, we cross the border and make our way to the military hospital in Lviv. And we interview a LearnTech CEO based in Odessa about what it is like to run a learning company from a war zone. Don't miss it. Since Ukraine Fundraiser 2022 formed at the start of the Russian invasion, the organisation has made more than 18 runs to Kyiv, the Donetsk region, Zaporizhia, Lviv, Dnipro and other destinations, targeting aid to those who need it most. Times may be difficult at home, but in Ukraine there are people whose lives have been totally destroyed. This effort relies on your donations, so please give what you can, no matter how small, on the Just Giving page at this link. Every penny you give will go to helping sufferers from this cruel conflict rebuild their lives. The link for your donations is justgiving.com slash crowdfunding slash Ukraine Fundraiser 2022. That's justgiving.com slash crowdfunding slash Ukraine Fundraiser 2022.